Welcome to a special episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Today, we are turning our attention to the vibrant city of Toronto, where an upcoming event has captured the attention of citizens and political enthusiasts alike. On Monday, June 26, a significant by-election will be taking place, aiming to elect the new mayor of Toronto and shape the course of the city's future for the remainder of the 2022-2026 city council term. Now, what makes this election truly remarkable, at least in my eyes, is the astonishing number of candidates vying for the position of mayor. Can you believe it? There are a staggering 102 individuals actively campaigning, each with their own vision and promise for the city they seek to lead. Now, to delve deep into this electoral extravaganza and explore the underlying issues, we have a special guest joining us today. During a stop at the Calgary airport, Warren Kinsella, a renowned Canadian lawyer, author, musician, political consultant, and commentator, has graciously accepted a spot on the show to talk about this important by-election. His perspectives and thought-provoking analysis have graced the pages of post-media newspapers across Canada, making him an authoritative voice in the world of Canadian politics. Together, we will navigate the complex landscape of the 2023 Toronto mayoral by-election. We will unravel the issues being raised by the candidates and examine the potential impact of this election, not only at a municipal level, but also provincially, and federally. Additionally, we will dive into the front runner, Olivia Chow. This election isn't just limited to the boundaries of Toronto. It is an event that should matter to more than just the residents of that great city. The decisions made by the newly elected mayor will undoubtedly have ripple effects that extend far beyond the city limits. These policies implemented and this challenges faced by the city, will reverberate provincially and federally, shaping the future landscape of our great nation. So whether you're a resident of Toronto, a passionate follower of Canadian politics, or simply, like me, someone interested in the dynamics of local governments, this episode is for you. So get ready to delve into the heart of Toronto's mayoral by-election and cover the stories, controversies, and aspirations that will shape the city's destiny. Fasten your seatbelts and get ready for a thrilling conversation about one of Canada's most dynamic cities. Let's go. So Warren, I want to start with the uh, big question. Uh, Torontonians head to the polls here in less than 26 days to elect their next mayor. Um from an Albertan's perspective, there hasn't been much noise and much campaigning. There's been a few debates, but is this a big election for not just Torontonians, but even for the country? I think it is in the sense that, I mean, it's Canada's biggest city, um, Canada's biggest economy, more headquarters are in the city of Toronto than anywhere else. Um, and, you know, sometimes, not all the time, where goes Toronto, so goes the country. So, um, you know, I, I'm a Calgarian who hated Toronto, and I got recruited to a law firm there and, and ended up staying for a number of years. I'm in Prince Edward County now with, with Enid, but, um, you know, Toronto is important, and the issues that are cropping up now in Toronto, I'm seeing elsewhere, you know, in interior BC, where we were uh, 48 hours ago, in Kelowna, 24 hours ago. A lot of the problems that Toronto's encountering and has been dealing with for a number of years are now manifesting themselves in other parts of the country. So what are those macro issues? What are the macro issues? Because we hear the social media chatter, which you should never believe what social media says, no. but <laughs> on the ground in Toronto, what's going on? Is it the crime? Is it the homelessness? Or is there more macro issues that people should be paying attention to? Well, you know, I write for Post Media, as you know, and... Um, uh, we have a tendency to reduce complex issues to bumper stickers, but I think this one does apply, which is crime and grime. Um, you know, you're seeing a state of decay in a lot of municipal centers where infrastructure is literally falling apart. Uh, there's not support for businesses uh, like Enid's. Um, and things just don't look as hot as they used to. And then, of course, uh, statistically, you know, crime was suppressed during the pandemic for the obvious reason that it was harder to do. It was harder to do everything, crime included. Well, that the the bottle, the the cork is off that bottle. And 
you know, crime, uh, however it manifests itself, violent and nonviolent, has exploded in just about every jurisdiction in the, the country. And so that's why in Toronto, you know, those are the two principal issues. What are you going to do about the obvious decay that is gripping the city and, and also the crime issue? And the, and the various, you know, manifestations of all of that, whether it's homelessness, tent cities, and so on. Like last night, we were in Kelowna, and um, our friends took us uh, to a place for dinner. And as we were leaving, we were, it was not, you know, poverty tourism. As we were leaving, we passed the, and perhaps you'll want to show this, you know, Polyev, uh, Pierre Polyev, earlier in the day, uh, put up a video saying, you know, Kelowna, looks like a third world city. Um, and I'm sure you may have seen that. I can tell you people in Kelowna are really mad that he did that because that's not going to be so uh, terrific for tourism. So anyway, we drove along after dinner, uh, Chris, and it was just like block after block after block after block of people living in tents. Like it looked like there were hundreds and hundreds of people there in Kelowna, you know, which is not, you know, a major city. And uh, we were saying, you know, I would imagine not everybody wants to live there. So uh, in, in Toronto, in Vancouver, you know, pretty much across the country, a lot of these issues are showing up now as political issues. And, and what I'm finding interesting is somebody's run political campaigns is candidates, you know, their brand used to be their party, um, you know, their personal history, their voting record you know, that sort of thing. Now it is where they land on these different issues. Like there's one guy, uh, Anthony Fury, who was one of my colleagues at the Toronto Sun, and he left us to go and work for some web-based thing. And uh, he decided to run for mayor. Uh, you know, and I'll be honest, and, uh, you know, Anthony knows, I think this, I thought he's had a snowball's chance of being picked out of a police lineup, let alone being a competitor. He's against, you know, um, uh, the city giving out uh, kits for crack addicts. He's against um, safe injection sites. He says he's going to get rid of them. Um, whether you approve of that or not, he's gone from zero to 10% in a matter of weeks. So that tells me that, you know, the issue matrix, like guys like me call it, has shifted. And that people are looking at their municipalities through the prism of non-traditional issues. It's not just picking up the trash and, um, you know, beautification and, and whatnot. It's like, Zena says, you know, what am I getting for my tax dollars? I don't feel safe walking down the street. And that's, you know, things look kind of crummy. So that's the issues that are showing up in Toronto in the mayoral by-election, because it's a by-election replacing by John Tory. Yeah. Big time, big time. Are people caring though? Because I talked to my family who lived in downtown Toronto, the El Eglinton Lawrence area, and to be honest, they said there's a by election happening. I didn't know that. Like <laughs> it because traditionally in uh, in Toronto, I believe campaign signs go out like this week, if I'm not mistaken. I think yep. there's a grace period, so they might know in about two weeks. But it doesn't seem like the by election has been making any traction, has it? It hasn't, you know, in a city of nearly 3 million people, one of my staff calculated that the race's outcome, you know, when you're mayor of Toronto, you have more power than most provincial premiers. You certainly have a larger budget, larger staff, and you're dealing with the big, big issues. You know, you talk to the prime minister directly. You don't have to speak to one of his cabinet ministers. The outcome of the election may be decided by 120,000 people for three really? million, a city of 3 million. And, you know, that testifies to the point you're making, which is, you know, people have become disengaged from municipal issues. And that's a big mistake because I'm a big believer in what Tip O'Neill, you know, the former leader of the House or the Democrats used to say is all politics is local. Yeah. All politics is local. That is the prism through which people look at, you know, their, their interaction with politicians and political life. And it just... I find it bizarre that people are disengaging from pol politics at the municipal level. Has, has the race become divided? Because 
provincially, federally, we see the uh, partisanship that we often see in provincial and federal politics. And I see it slowly creeping into the municipal realm, whether it be the blues versus the reds or the greens versus the orange or even the purples versus whoever. But do you see in Toronto the uh, partisanship, the uh sort of the party partisanship mm-hmm. sort of becoming a big thing in Toronto mayoral election, a by-election. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Olivia Chow, I supported, I helped run her campaign in 2014. And now I'm a newspaper columnist, so I'm not involved in anybody's campaign. But Olivia is way, way ahead for, I think, partly the reason you cite, which is the left, the so-called left, New Democrats and, um, you know, center-left liberals have gathered behind a single candidate, which is Olivia. The right, and I had said this to some colleagues and media friends uh, some months ago, the right was scattered. It was divided, right? And so as a consequence, uh, they were undisciplined. And Olivia now, like I swear to God, she's got like a 25-point lead on her nearest competitor. She is going to be the next mayor of Toronto. And um, Do you, you truly know, think that? Out, yeah, for sure. She's going to she, – I was just looking at the numbers before we spoke. Like it's unless there's some dramatic event in the next seven to nine days, it's written like she is going to be the next mayor of Toronto when the city repudiated her and reduced her to third place in 2014. So like being disciplined in terms of this partisan choice, as regrettable as it is, you know, our municipal politics is not supposed to be that way. In Vancouver it is, but not elsewhere. Like, you know, Alberta, you know, look at Daniel Smith. I think she's a disaster of a candidate, a politician. Uh, I, I can't stand her, but she won a majority because the right coalesced behind that single choice. Rachel Notley last lot, one last time when Wild Rose was still a factor. So that kind of uh, partisan, you know, infection, if you want to call it that, has happened in our politics municipally. Federally and provincially, are is Justin Trudeau and Doug Ford watching this election closely? Because they're they they will live and die by what happens in Toronto in the next general election, whether it be federally or provincially. Absolutely. So are are the two part two uh, leaders of the province and the uh, federal yeah. government looking at this more than they traditionally would have in the last general election for the municipal? Uh, yeah, the absolutely. I mean, Doug, who I know quite well was a municipal councillor. That's what he was before, you know, he became a premier. And he also lost in the race where Olivia ran. And Justin is looking at more seats in the GTA than all of Alberta, right? Uh, Which drives Albertans, as I know, crazy. So it's just the clout of the GTA is, as you know, because you've got family there, is enormous. So, um, and the mayor of Toronto is a position of significant power. And significant influence. The one prediction I'll make on your show, and you can make fun of me if I get it wrong, I, I know personally, because I know both of them well, Olivia and Doug, I do not believe are going to be fighting as much as people think. Um, Olivia's, you know, a deceased husband, um, Jack Layton, who sadly passed away about a decade ago, he and Rob Ford, unbelievably, were exceedingly close. They used to sit together in council. And as you know, at the municipal level, those kinds of relationships kind of transcend ideology sometimes. So the, you know, the Leighton Chows and the Fords, they know each other a bit better than people realize. So I don't anticipate there's going to be these ideological tong wars all the time. Um, but, you know, she's got strong mayor powers. And just, you know, for those who haven't heard of that, she is permitted to pass certain types of legislative change on the basis of the support of six councillors, I believe, six or eight. So she doesn't need the rest of council. She doesn't have to use the bully pulpit of the mayor's office to change minds. She just needs a small coterie of councillors with her, and she can do pretty much whatever she wants. It's an executive function, like you see in the United States with the President of the United States. So that that's going to make things quite interesting in Toronto, because now a new Democrat who's open openly and and to her credit, you know, saying, I'm going to raise your taxes, you know, we're going to have more bike lanes, we're going to have more safe injection sites. She's not hiding it. She's not coaching it. That's what she's saying she's going to do. So it's going to be interesting. I'm just, I live in Prince Edward County, so I'm looking at it from a different perspective. 
And from an outsider's perspective, for me, I'm looking at it, I'm seeing the division of the five original cities that make up the yeah, metropolitan yeah. like whether it be scarborough york uh the don uh like downtown uh core of toronto is that going to play a factor in who actually wins like because i'm looking at it like mitzi hunter i'm assuming would do better in scarborough than compared to downtown because she's yeah. originally from scarborough yeah. uh, olivia represented uh trinity spadina so she's going to do well there yeah. is that playing out as a factor in this election or is it basically just olivia's to lose basically because she's so far ahead and she's making gains in all the, parts of the downtown world. is not enough to get you where you need to go you know you need to have some old momentum uh, in some other parts of the city. So I think Olivia does have some Scarborough action happening. Uh, I don't see her being a factor, kind of a tobacco, you know, out towards the west end of the, the uh, city. Uh, but, you know, it's what Enid was talking about earlier. Like some places amalgamation, you know, bringing together these individual elements. Maybe it worked. In Prince Edward County, didn't. And in Toronto, there's still people ruining the fact that Mike Harris did this, you know, 25 years ago. So what's Doug Ford doing? He's taking Peel Region, which is Mississauga, Caledon, and Brampton, and he's breaking it up. And in full disclosure, I represent uh, Brampton on that file. And they're kind of nervous about the, the future because they've got to figure out how to pay for some services that are geographically located over in Mississauga. But, you know, Patrick Brown, I think, has a vision about how he's going to do it. And so it is doable. But yeah, your point is well taken. Um, you know, like Scarborough is bigger than just about any Alberta city other than Calgary and Edmonton. And, uh, you know, they have to pay attention to what's being said by some councillor in downtown Toronto. It drives them crazy. So I guess the, the big ending question here, Warren, is this. Why should people outside of Toronto care about this election? You talk about how it's the largest city in Canada, which is understandable, but w what is going to change if a mayor, Olivia Chow, becomes the next mayor of Toronto compared to when Mayor John Tory was mayor? Is there any big policy direction or is it going to impact what happens out in Vancouver or Kelowna or even Winnipeg? Or is it just what's going to happen in downtown Toronto? I'm a big believer, the saying I always use with my war rooms I run is in yesterday walks tomorrow. And um, so, you know, one thing that's important. So in British Columbia, where we were this morning, you've got a new democratic government, a social democratic government, but it's kind of de-radicalized itself from what it was in opposition. And as a consequence, it continues to be, you know, the BC United, as they're now called. Um, that's the significance of new Democrats or Daniel Smith types achieving power is power has a moderating effect on them. I find, you know, the ideological maniacs kind of suddenly find that they're not welcome anymore. And what worked in opposition just doesn't work in government. So I think if Olivia becomes effectively a provincial premier, it can only do well for new Democrats. It kind of legitimizes them across the country. But, you know, the, the paradox is if you do a really shitty job, if you make a lot of mistakes, you can cause a problem for your party brand um, across the country, too. And a good example of that is Justin Trudeau. There's not a provincial liberal party left except for Newfoundland. And, and, the Yukon, and the and, Yukon. And the Yukon. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, but they're hanging on by their fingernails. So, like, you know, Trudeau uh, has, has had, caused some damage to the the liberal brand at the provincial level. So it can really work for you. It's like nitroglycerin, right? It can propel rockets, but it also can blow up on you. So it'll be interesting to see what Mayor Chow does. And uh, because I think it is going to be Mayor Chow. What's her big thing that she has to accomplish if she gets, if she is the successful candidate? Is it just calm everybody the... down? They calm what? everybody down. Day in 1976, I'm an old guy after the, the separatists, after the Parti Québécois one election in Montreal where I was born and we left, you know, that's why we came to Alberta. And after uh, Levesque was elected, Aislinn had this great cartoon in the Montreal Gazette saying, okay, everybody take a Valium. So, you know, I think that's what she needs to do. She needs to get everybody to calm down and say, look, I'm not going to turn this into a socialist enterprise. 
Um, you know, uh, we want to make the city work for you. We want to deal with crime and grime. Um, and we may have some different ways of doing that, but that's where we I think she's become a mature enough politician that she's going to do that. Thank you to Warren. Uh, greatly appreciated taking time out of your layover at the Calgary airport to sit down with me via Zoom and talk about the Toronto mayoral election. To our viewers, thank you for tuning in and being part of this conversation. If you've enjoyed it, please hit the subscribe button. It helps us so much. If you enjoyed this episode, please, again, hit the subscribe button so that way you can stay up to date on all of our latest interviews, special guests, and of course, we have some amazing guests lined up, and we can't wait to share their stories with you. Now, if you're able to, please consider backing the show to help us to continue to grow and produce more high-quality content. Every little bit helps, and we appreciate your support. A link to our Patreon account is in the show notes below. Now, don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram for more behind-the-scenes content, show updates, and much more. And finally, and this is the big one, as much as we love our phones and technology, let's remember to put them down and have real-life in-person conversations with the people in our lives, even if it's just for five minutes. Thanks again for watching another great episode of the Crossboard Interviews. Until next time, just remember, just keep talking.